good morning to one and all. I have a, a right mixture of panelists here on the dais. There are uh, industry experts, startups who have wetted their hands. They will be able to speak with more confidence now. And uh, academia, along with uh, uh, the government entities, is a right mixture to talk today's topic. So uh, space trans transportation job is very simple to put the satellite into orbit. But it has to be done in a cost-effective way as well as in a fast, with a fast pace depending upon the vendor requirement. You can see here uh, the uh, launch vehicles that is row. Right now, okay, the, the, the history of history is also part of that because uh, we started with the sounding rockets and SLV, ASLV, these are the two launch vehicles. Those are not there now. PSLV, GSLV, Mark III, they are in uh, operation and uh, SSLV is the new experiment for um, small satellite, targeting small satellite. And you can also see the next generation launch vehicle where we want to make use of the expertise of all of us, not only ISRO, industries and the whole nation and the lessons learned we want to integrate properly so that we can get a modular concept which can be used by all and that will meet our future requirement. Uh, right now, if you look at the cost of access, in the Indian context, it is uh, roughly something like PSLV is around uh, close to $10,000 per kg. But uh, that is not the lowest, of course, there are low, still lower offers are there, thanks to the disruptive technology introduced by commercial players like uh, SpaceX, SpaceX, where they recover the stage and reuse. Traditionally, such vehicles have been called as expendable launch vehicles. Now, it's no longer expendable, including the payload firing. Now, the, there are proposals, and they are even they have done experiments to uh, recover it. The recovery concept could be uh, different depending upon uh, the country as well as from where you are launching. For example, you can see here the stage recovery concept by SpaceX where the same stage, the same propulsion is used for uh, decelerating and making a soft landing on a barge. So it could be a soft landing, you can guide to a barge, the technology requirement required is different, or you can decelerate and lower the velocity and make it float on sea and then recover. You don't have to control and guide to a specific point. But then uh, we also know that a rocket, when you launch, the launch station and the impact constraint, there are many constraints. For example, we did a study, can we uh, recover, say, GSLV Mark III first stage as it is? It is not at all economical. You need to design for recovery. That is, if you look at SpaceX, 60% of, roughly 60% of the vehicle cost is in first stage itself. It's made as of lithium, aluminum um, uh, material, plus 27 Merlin engines are there, so it's effective in that sense. So how cost can be reduced? So that is how we are now working on, uh, on a low budget cost, uh, low budget experiments, like reusable launch vehicle, can we bring back? We know that uh, SpaceX as well as Buran, their experiment, they have done, they have burned their fingers. It may not be cost effective, but still, we are trying in our own way. And then, uh, the inflatable aerodynamics decelerator can be used for stage, reducing the stage speed. In fact, we did an experiment recently uh, in a sounding rockets. The concept is proved. It's, it is possible you can deploy it in supersonic or hypersonic condition and then you can recover it. But it has to be properly scaled up. And we also have a test vehicle which is based on a single stage, that is uh, L40 stage of uh, PS2 stage of PSLV is a single stage vehicle, but that vehicle is designed and developed in such a way that can be used as a platform for many experiments. We are going to use it for testing of the crew escape system. The same vehicle we wanted to bring back and then try thrott throttling and then make a soft landing. And the same vehicle we will be using for if required, it can be used for space tourism purpose. In fact, those who are interested can work with us. We are not going into space tourism, but definitely those who are interested, this test vehicle coupled with a few of the technologies from Gaganian, you can go to say the one car man lane, 100 kilometer and come back. 
Yeah, at the same time, uh, you know, the propulsion also is a scenario is changing. We want eco-friendly propulsion. Uh, we want uh, production-friendly engines. We know that right now, if we the engine manufacturing situation in our country, we have limitations in making the numbers that are required to make GSLV Mark III. In fact, if you want to have, say, four or six launches per year, there are constraints. In fact, the cryo stage itself, you want to have the cryo engine. Mass production is a real constraint. As, as well as throttling of the engine to make it recovery, to use it for recovery, as well as log methane engine. In fact, our um, LPSC friends are uh, in a very advanced stage in terms of semi cryo as well as log methane. But I am wondering that uh, the startups like uh, Agnigul and Google, they start with semi cryo. That is the confidence of youngsters. We have taken uh, decades to start working on uh, semi cryo, but they are taking off with the uh, uh, semi career propulsion. So good luck to all of them. And uh, yes, launch vehicle is for satellite, but we know that the current trend is mostly for uh, small and nano satellites. The projected um, market is very, very uh, attractive and ambitious. And uh, it is expected something like 17,000 satellites will be launched uh, maybe in another 10 years. 2021 itself has witnessed more than 1,700 satellites, small satellites. So this is uh, really, this is one area where the launch vehicle also should be prepared. The question is, uh, now can we use the conventional launch vehicles for that? Or you should make a small satellite targeting for that. So there are, this, uh, there are so many small satellite vehicles world over. We can also see the SSLV by ISRO also is there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's true that at some point of time it is going to be a, a flight. It's going to flatten. This uh, requirement will not grow continuously. So this is about SSLV. We have. Uh, we know that if you want to launch small satellite in a Mark III vehicle, you have to wait till the major satellite comes. And also, such lo large vehicles requires long lead time, like uh, 45 to 50 or 60 days to launch because the preparation is so intense. But a uh, solid propulsion based SSLV is a fully solid propulsion based, but we have a very s last stage is a small stage which is for use for trimming or adjusting the velocity. We, the first vehicle itself, we assembled in just two days. So you can see the type of flexibility you have with uh, SSLV. We can launch within a week and then it's, uh, we can be stored for uh, months because it is solid propulsion. Yes, uh, this is my uh, last uh, slide. Yeah, we know that see, things are changing globally and it is not it is, uh, so in India. There are mechanisms like in space, ENSIL, ISRO. There are startups, industries are all interacting. There is, there is no boundary now. But uh, as you can see, we have the ISRO has the skill, has the uh, infrastructure like launch pad and other things. Whereas industries, they have the experience of working in space, they are going to take more and more responsibilities. And the government, definitely the type of legal provisions, as well as the policies that are also in the final phase. And academia and other institutions, I, I won't say that academia, they are there in that, but they are not solution providers or system providers like MIT or other things, other uh, institutes in the world. So there is a need for them to come up and become solution providers. So I hope uh, this circle is going to be more and more effective and it is going to run faster and faster, bringing that two-digit uh, economy or the 10 percent whatever of the space to global economy to India. Uh, with that, I conclude. I will uh, start with the, the discussion uh, or fellow panelists are here. I think uh, we will probably restrict ourselves to six to seven minutes, something like that. Um, Maybe I'll sit there and then, so with that introduction, the purpose of that introduction is to just put a, a reference from where we can all take off. We have the panelists, probably I'll start with uh, Mr. Balaji, he's from HL. Mr. Balaji, you, you have already won the consortium approach for PSLV along with L&D. Congratulations to you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So you have been a very... Uh, constant uh, supporter as well as a major player in Indian space program also. So how do you think this is going to, uh, how you are going to take off 
do you think the pace for this process is as you expect and uh, on the main theme also you can offer your comments and you can address these questions over to mr balaji um, um, actually uh, uh, our partnership with uh, lnt for this uh, PSLV productionization as a consortium uh, we we welcome the welcome isro for uh, ansel for giving us this opportunity and i know the path will be very challenging it's not easy uh, the whole uh, glamour part is over that uh, we are we have uh, bid a, uh, in a competitive bidding we have uh, won this uh, contract and uh, now uh, the ground the time uh, zero is started and uh, we need to pull all our resources and see that uh, we come to the expectations of uh, ansel and isro in their uh, uh, in their requirement uh, of uh, pslv we will not uh, we have been given time for four years uh, we'll try and see how we can quickly uh, realize this hardware and uh, deliver of course uh, with the support of the industry uh, we have a supply chain of almost uh, uh, 300 uh, ought to manage and we hope we will get all the support from the industry for realizing the dreams of isro thank you thank you mr balaji we have mr manak barham kamdeen from Ass assistant vice president godrej aerospace he is uh, with a mechanical background godrej is also a very strong partner in our uh, uh, space program um, Mr. Banak, uh, you can give your comments on the topic that we are discussing today. At the same time, you know, you the about the cryo as well as uh, liquid engine manufacturing. Uh, there is a gap between the demand as well as the supply. Unless we ramp up this production and uh, tied over the bottlenecks, uh, you know, the the type of projection what we are expecting eh, is unlikely to reach. Over to Mr. Manak for your comments. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, Godrej has been in uh, propulsion systems with uh, blessings of ISRO for last 30 years. And uh, we have ramped up uh, capacities as per the requirement of the country, starting from the Vikas engine to the cryo and now working with semi-cryo. Uh, we definitely look forward to working with the consortium of LNT and HAL for supplying all the engines required for the PSLV program. Uh, on the question of uh, increasing capacities, uh, capacities will be increased based on the uh, uh, requirements of uh, the space programs. Uh, last two years have been very bad f for all of us uh, with reduction in number of launches, but now we see the pickup is coming. I think industry is uh, very well uh, uh, organized and ready. The supply chain is ready to uh, uh, facilitate all the requirements of uh, ISRO. Uh, on the semi-cryo, uh, we have a challenge which is in the development stage and the faster we are able to put that engine in place, uh, I think uh, the country will benefit with higher payloads, which today we are dependent on the uh, other countries. So uh, here we uh, seek help from the various consortium partners from ISRO to push this uh, project forward and uh, bring it to completion. On the integration part, uh, we are definitely uh, aware and uh, we would like to uh, take that forward also on integration of the engines by the private industry and that will really uh, help to increase the uh, capacities in the country. So uh, this is what I had to put forward as the, my opening comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Manak. We have uh, the Mr. Rajat Kulshetra. He is the CEO and co-founder of Space Machines Company. That is an Australian startup. He is a very trained uh, aerospace uh, engineer. Uh, Mr. Rajat, uh, I understand that you are, uh, you are uh, into area where precise as well as reliable access to space, including deep space destinations as well as in space mobility. See, considering uh, the theme of today's discussion, that is the space transportation, uh, technological capabilities and research, 
how do you i would like to hear your comments with a specific thrust on your uh, you know the deep space destination how you are going to meet so thanks for having me on this panel um just i have a uh, suggestion if any, anybody any one of you is having uh, anything like a powerpoint or anything visual media if you want to use you can use yeah over to mr rajat sure um, so look thank you for having me on the panel um i just like to open by saying um, and extending the definition of space transportation. For a long time, space transportation's been about launch. Um, and I think as you overlay customers on top of it, you start to think about the last mile. How do we effectively and efficiently deliver satellites to the de different destinations customers want to go to? So the first mile being low cost, reliable access to space, which a lot of the large launches, as you talked about earlier, and small launches are starting to fulfill. How do we start to support government, commercial, and deep space exploration customers with the last mile services? So part of our focus has been um, to create um, in-space transportation and logistics capability that complements launchers out there, uh, but starts to service customers. Historically, if you see terrestrial logistics, you find uh, the hub and spoke model, where things have gone from um, ground to space, and then from there um, to final destination. So from a deep space perspective, especially starting to change the paradigm on large budget multi-instrument missions to low cost, reliable, short missions using small launchers and big, big launchers in a ride share configuration. So I think from our perspective, the focus should be faster access to those deep space uh, destinations with uh, low cost and reliable high cadence missions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Rajat. Uh, now we, we have uh, with me Mr. Vinod. He is the project director of Small Satellite Launch Vehicle. He has accomplished this project in spite of all the COVID uh, related di difficulties in a very short time with a very small team. And the first launch, uh, we had the first launch, but due to a, a small glitch, we could not reach the final uh, orbit. So, may I, Mr. Vinod, you can. Give us your experience in working on small satellite uh, area and then uh, how the future is going to be for SSLV in terms of its future production and then how it is going to be available for vendors. Please. Uh, good morning to all. Anyway, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation uh, like our director was mentioning. I recollect uh, that one month back, the whole SSLV team was in Shar, probably relaxing after completing the integration, the assembly, the checkout, and also even the launch rehearsal on the 6th of August. And being tense to have, to go into the next day where we were going to have the launch, that's on 7th uh, for the maiden flight of SSLV, which, is bound to have a major role to play uh, in the current uh, new policy ecosystem, new space policy ecosystem. So like our director was mentioning, uh, if you look at the current scenario, he was indicating the uh, amount of a small satellite which is going to be in the foray. It's about uh, 1,700 odd satellites in uh, 17,000 satellites in 10 year time frame. So why uh, ISRO cannot play a role in that? That was a question which was asked to us and uh, we looked at uh, the exciting uh, uh, existing launch vehicle which we were having, PSLV. If you look at PSLV, uh, the launch capability is there but the vi economical viability is not there. So we need to have a different kind of a launch vehicle which has many traits like what has been mentioned by here that it should be low cost, reliable, and it should have low turnaround time and also it should have multiple capability in terms of accommodating the satellite and achieving the various orbit. With these factors into consideration, we have gone for uh, realizing the SSLV. So that's what I want to kind of uh, present before you and also tell the industry how you can make use of this opportunity what we are going to present before you. Like I mentioned, the low cost we have achieved in a sense that it will be about one-fifth or one-sixth the cost of existing PSLV. That's what we have aimed and we have achieved that. 
and uh, I would like to thank the industries for that because the way in which they have been with us that has helped them in uh, lowering the cost and of course the flexibility with respect to the multi-satellite launch capability is also there and uh, before that uh, the uh, in in one of the sense uh, to reduce the cost what we looked at is the size of it uh, like it was mentioned here it is about two meter size and we wanted from the very beginning itself that the existing traditional space industries which are already having their hands full should be kind of set aside initially so that we do have a second tier of industries coming up and doing the job for us. I am happy to say that we have developed about 25 new industries exclusively for SSLV purpose. They were first of industries producing for the first time any space related activities. So that's the one way in which we were able to reduce the cost. Another major system which add to the cost is the avionic system. If you look at it, the FE content of it is very high. So how to reduce that? We had a shift in our design methodology itself that uh, we went ahead inducting the industrial or courts case uh, based component, judiciously mingling it with the mill standard components. So we have about 135 industrial grade component or courts component which is going into our system and about 95% of avionic system which we have realized are new in uh, miniaturized avionic system. And we went for the supercapacitor for powering our system because it is one third cost of the existing battery system. These are the major things which uh, we did. Of course, we did the standardization in terms of using some of the electromechanical actuator for all the three stages, then going ahead with the propellant formulation, which is again the same for all the systems. The low turnaround time was achieved by using the existing technology which we are having and also modular concept for many of the stage separation system or the, uh, the thrust termination system. We need to have a launch on demand because unlike PSLV or we, we have to look at is, it has been told there could be a constellation of satellite which is available there. And what we are targeting is not to launch that uh, entire constellation because we have PSLV and also GSLV Mark 3. And uh, Mark 3 is already coming up with uh, launching about 36 uh, one web satellite. What we are looking at is the replacing the satellite which have already ended its life. How to replace that? So for that, we need to have a low turnaround time that is possible with SSLV, which can be assembled in two days time and probably giving uh, two days for uh, accessing or checking it out and within the fifth or sixth day. So we need to have uh, some time provided of course because it's a rocket so time need to be provided for that. The accommodation with respect to multiple satellite is also possible in SSLV. We have definitely uh, payload envelope available and different DLA configuration can be possible. So what we offer today to the industry is a low cost access which will be an end to end model for you to pursue so that the entire thing from the realization of the rocket, finding the satellite and launching it will be your target. And ISRO would be handling a different path. We will be the, of course, looking at the design aspect of it. The quality control and the non-conformance management need to be done by the industry, but we will help them out in managing the non-conformance and also ensuring the quality assurance of it. And also ultimately, like uh, our uh, chairman in space was mentioning, all this will be within the new space policy, which is already on the anvil or it's already gone out of the anvil and it is about to be released. So it will be that. The industry is of course free to do any design modification which they plan to do and also bring in new technologies like uh, the artificial intelligence, the AI based systems, systems on chips and systems on uh, systems and also having a different approach in manufacturing it. But in future what ISRO would be doing is to progressively improve the payload capability of the SSLV. Right now we have 500 kg in kilogram in 500 kilometer orbit. It will be progressively improved like what we have been doing for PSLV, which started with uh, 800 kilogram and ultimately in LEO it is ending up with about two tons. So that is what we are planning. 
and uh, if you look at the SSLV part of it, uh, it's going to be a game changer for ISRO in the sense that whatever new concept we have avoided, uh, adopted can be straight away merged into the existing launch vehicle. It will be a game changer for the industry because they are going to have a rocket in the hand which will be from end-to-end -end production to the under launch services. And we had only six member team and with the support of the sound solid base of technical support of ISRO we were able to launch. So that's the point to be pondered that the industry with their capability and the support of INSIL, INSPACE and ISRO, what they can achieve. And if you look at it, it is going to be a wonderful confluence and we in ISRO would be looking at the outcome of this confluence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vinod. And uh, to all the startups, we are ready to share with you uh, the details on SSLV2 if you are interested. We have uh, Dr. Chris Verhoeven, he is Associate Professor, Electronics Research Lab, he is uh, Department of Microelectronics in uh, Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands. Uh, I would like to get your views on the topic. Plus, uh, in our launch vehicles, see for example, PSLV, 80% is indigenized. What is not indigenized is mostly avionics or electronic system, which we depend heavily on import. But uh, we find that post-COVID, there is a huge disruption to the supply chain of uh, the electronic system, and we get, there is inordinate, inordinate delay in getting delivery of components from many multinationals. Um, at the same time, there are varieties of uh, electronics like industrial grade or milk grade or space grade. And we see that many of the startups and other uh, uh, worldwide, they all switch over to industrial grade components for cost reduction. I just uh, would like to get your views on how the miniaturization is evolving and your views on uh, the theme of uh, today's discussion. Thank you. Okay, well, th thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel session. It, uh, it really made me, made me think, and uh, it also gives me an opportunity to express my gratitude to, uh, to Israel because we cooperate very well. Uh, we started cooperating with the INS satellites. Uh, we share ground station facilities, which is uh, unique that uh, satellites are commanded from another country than India uh, with, with the Netherlands. So beautiful opportunities, a lot of inspiration and access to space. Uh, and uh, that made me actually think, what should I tell? here today. The words new paradigm were buzzing in my head. So what is the new paradigm and what could the university be there? And I was thinking, is the new paradigm we having a new technology or uh, something like that? But lots of the things are improvements. Like I thought, is my iPhone 13 an, in a paradigm shift with respect to iPhone 1? And I don't think it's, of course, a better phone. Uh, and then I started thinking, is it maybe about who wants to go to space if we talk about uh, transportation? And uh, well, I work in an educational institute, so you talk about education, and I think actually who wants access to space, like we at the university, are school children, so to get to space. And I know that there are a lot of children in India and all over the world that have fantasies about having something in space. Can that be realized? And now we are working on a an, on an system that is called Space Truck. Uh, and uh, to, to tell you what it is, uh, when you buy a mouse, you plug it into the USB and it works. So uh, just like that. So you, could you imagine a little box with a USB connection? Uh, you plug it in your computer, the computer says, I'm a satellite, I'm, an, uh, I'm a satellite, and you can do an experiment in the box as uh, school children, and then the, you do the simulation on the, on, the, on the computer, and then at some point it says, it's fine, I can live in a satellite. Then you actually put it in a satellite with a USB connection, we call it the space truck. You put the satellite on a PLCV, it goes to space, and then the children can from space see their experiment it would bring the, doors, the, the space on the doorstep of school children. Uh, and the, the funny thing is, this looks like a fantasy, but because of uh, rockets like PLCV exist, it can actually be done. 
So at the moment, there is a space truck developed, one space truck where little school children of the Netherlands thought of an experiment with dice. They built something in a unit that is USB. It is tested. It is put on a satellite that could be the space truck. And it is, I think, quite likely that it is a PLCV that will bring it to space. And then school children can, on an antenna in the garden with, an, uh, with, with a simple receiver, see their experiment there. Uh, and actually, I thought, well, maybe the paradigm shift is that there is access to, space, access to space for many people, but ISRO, with the technology, can actually give access to space to school children that become young engineers that build the future, and there you go with your paradigm shift. So, uh, so there, is, there is one being built, and if you would come to the Dutch booth, I can tell you more about it. It would take too much time over here. But I see a golden opportunity where actually India has the opportunity to, to bring at low cost, as we heard, into space, whatever you want to take into space, why not give school children access to space in a safe environment, let them build something that connects to USB, test it on the computer, have some organization check if it can actually be safe in the rocket, and the only thing that Israel has to do is take a space truck of VU. Well, that's peanuts for Israel, I think. That would be my paradigm shift. And if you talk about technologies, if you have a space truck like that, and you think, hey, I thought of something, maybe it can't go to space, then you go to the professional side of space truck, you put your device in the USB connector, it goes in the space truck, and it goes up, and you can do your testing. So there's a professional side, and there's a uh, uh, side with school children, I think that might be a paradigm shift in launching, and there are a few countries in the world that would be able to do this, and, uh, and India is one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chris.